This is Ben Woods interviewing for the Oklahoma Living Legends and the Cherokee Historical Society. The, uh, we, the date is uh, May 1971, and we're here on the day of the reunion of the male and female uh, seminaries in uh, Tahlequah, Oklahoma. And I have with me Mrs. Eva Dameron Uli, who is Mrs. W. H. Uli. Uh, from Wilburton, Oklahoma, who attended the seminary, the female seminary, from 1901 till 1904. Her mother and her grandmother also are graduates of this uh, female seminary. Uh, to begin with, uh, why don't you tell us where you were born, who your parents uh, were, and uh, where you, uh, your education began? I was born in Benita, Oklahoma, Indian Territory, uh, you don't have to tell 18 and 90, uh, 1885 is when I was born. My father was John L. Dameron, and my mother, before she was married, was Martha Lee Adair, and she married John L. Dameron, and uh, had a big family. <laughs> I was the oldest daughter, but I had two brothers older than I, who, when they were 14, were sent to the seminary. Did you grew up in Benita? Yes. Uh, I went to school in uh, the public school in Benita. Tell us about Benita. And, uh, oh, good gracious, don't get me started on Benita. <laughs> and they, uh, our teachers in Benita, when I started school, was uh, two great aunts, Aunt Eugenia Thompson and Aunt Hallie Thompson. And we children, of course, were put in, they were, that's the only school we had at Benita at that time, was that public school. Later on, we got the Willie Hawks College, and we got the academy there later, and then a, a business school there. But uh, mother and grandmother, on mother's side of the house insisted that we children come to the seminary where they had come to school. Mother had finished at the uh, Cherokee Seminary and so had my grandmother. Well, so when I was 14, put near 14, not quite, and my sister was put near 13, we were brought down here to seminary, to school, Tahlequah, and put there to school. Can you describe the seminary when you first came here, what it was like, what was it? Oh, it was such a wonderful place, the prettiest building I think I, I was ever in, and it is the first time I was ever in a building that had three stories in it. So I was quite excited, and there was a bathroom in it, and we'd always had home. We didn't have no bathroom. We just had a wash tub to wash in. Love to go down the creek and go swimming more than anything else. But, um, and uh, we were, my sister and I was put up on the third floor to room because the beginners, new children, were put on third floor. The uh, higher children were put on second floor to live, but we were put up on the third floor. And that was exciting to go up those three flights of stairs from the schoolroom clear up there. Well, we enjoyed it. We run when the teachers wasn't watching us. <laughs> well, I was here three, the, 1901, 1902, 1903, 1904 was to be my last year. But the uh, Board of Education came up one day to, to the school and told us that they were building an uh, Indian Territory building in St. Louis for the World's Fair of 1904, and that they wanted exhibits for the uh, fair. And from handcrafts of all kinds, and that they were asking the different tribes of Indians in the territory to make exhibits, and would we please make an exhibit? The teachers said they hadn't been teaching handcraft or handwork, they'd only been teaching just books. So uh, he said, well, I know they know enough that, that you teachers are to help. Well, only one teacher really knew very much about handcraft, and that was Beulah Edmondson. And Miss Alexander knew some, and Miss Janana Ballard knew some, and uh, Miss Mineola Ward knew a little bit about handcrafts, but they were also interested in that. Well, Miss Cherry Kiadare, who was our music teacher in voice, piano, and did painting, 
So she said she would have some of her girls to do some painting. Well, then, uh, of course, Miss Cora McNair, who was the other music teacher, she said that she didn't do any handcrafts. So Beulah said that she would take over at the Beulah Edmondson. And uh, she says, now I know one of the girls in, in the school know more than I do. And we'll ask, have to take her on as one assistant teacher. So the board then asked the girls in the chapel to stand up that knew anything about handcraft. I was the only one to stand up. I was crazy more about handcrafts than I was schoolwork anyway. So uh, he said, did, did I know of any of the other girls that knew handcraft? And I said, oh, there's several girls know how to do beadwork and basket work and stuff like that. But I said, they're not standing up because they're a little bit shy is all. And he said, well, do you suppose you can get up a class to help you out in that? And I said, oh, I know I can. Beulah spoke up and she said, well, of course we can. And uh, the uh, principal, who was Miss Ryder, says, well, where in the world are the girls going to work? I spoke up right quick and I said, oh, up in Sleepy Holler. That was a big room, bigger than this room, on the third floor. And it didn't have anything in it, not a thing. Uh, we youngsters used to get in there and make a lot of rocket noise. That was our playroom up on the third floor. And we called it Sleeper Holler because we had to be quiet, but we never were. <laughs> and so they said then they'd get sewing machines and ask us to name over what we'd have to have. Board of Education said they'd supply all the uh, material if we would work on it. So then Miss Beulah Edmondson and Miss uh, Lillian Alexander and Miss um, Janana Dallard took the names all down of the girls that volunteered to help. And they said then that uh, they would be extra time for them to get their lessons. Well, that didn't mean a thing to me. I wasn't crazy about lessons anyway. Well, anyway, I took over the, uh, the uh, beadwork, the embroidery work, the drawn work, the point lace, and the uh, basket work. And I told them what all they'd have to have for that. Well, the Board of Education took it all down, and they s ordered supplies and brought them up. And then I told Miss Edmondson, I said, listen, Beulah, we've got to have a sewing machine. We've got to do some real pretty fancy work, you know. So she told them about it, and they brought us up a sewing machine. We started in. And I, and oh, I guess it must have been, that was in February. Well, in March, why, uh, Miss Ryder said, uh, came up one day and she said, Eva, when are you going to class? I said, when we get through the exhibit. She said, how are you going to graduate this year if you don't pass your examinations? I said, oh, I'll pass them. Don't worry, I'll get them at some other, in study hour or sometime or another. I never did. Never, hard, uh, once in a while I'd go to class. I love mathematics and I didn't, and I love my dramatics. And uh, we, of course, put on plays and I always took the leading part and stuff like that because I was more interested in that than I was in, in uh, English. I was very poor in English. But I was good in mathematics and I was pretty good in some of the other studies. So when come to examination, I passed everything but my English. <laughs> this writer told me I couldn't get my diploma, couldn't graduate. I said, well, I've got all this pretty exhibit we've made. We did everything in beadwork, basket work, drawn work, point lace, and, and embroidered raffetas and made rugs, and we had a wonderful exhibit. And the teachers were very proud of it. And the Board of Education was glad to furnish it, everything. Of course, the boys were doing things, too. Well, uh, finally, when they come time for us to graduate, I wasn't going to get no diploma because it didn't pass in English. So uh, they had a board meeting on me. <laughs> they said, well, now listen, if she will go to normal school and take English, just English in normal, that's six weeks of normal, you know, and take English and pass that examination, we'll give her a diploma. All right. I've, I volunteered to stay for normal. 
I never stayed for normal or anything. I had no intention of being a teacher. And that's all that te was for teachers, you know. But I said, I'd stay for normal and take English. I just, and Miss Alexandra I knew was the English teacher, and she was very strict. She loved nice, good English. But it didn't worry me. I'd had such a good time all that spring making that exhibit that I was willing to go to six weeks normal. All right, I went to normal school, and I took English, and I passed the examination. And when they come time to um, appoint teachers, well, they asked me if I was going to teach. And I said, oh, no, I don't think I want to teach. I want to go to away to college. My grandmother wants me to go away and take dramatics. Well, then they let that drop. I went home. My father passed away on the 4th of July and left mother with all of us six children to raise and educate. Well, Brother Henry was through seminary and was teaching. Brother Rex was through and had uh, gone down Spalpa to... Uh, Learn to be a railroad engineer. Well, there I come next. So, mother says, are you going to teach? She says, I can't afford to send you away to take special. And I said, well, I guess so. She says, what kind of a teach school do you want? I said, oh, I just take country public school because I can talk Cherokee to their little full bloods, and uh, that's the only kind I want. So when the Board of Education called up Mother and asked Mother, would I take a school? Mother said, yes, she has decided she'll take a public school, but she wants one out in the country. He said, well, that's the only place we can use her, because she can talk Cherokee, and some of the other teachers that have come in and wants public school can't talk Cherokee to the little full blood. We've got one for her that there are 53 little full blood children that can't talk a word English. Mother said, all right, give it to her. She'll take it and be glad to have it. So that was the closest ferry school over, it's right on Grand River now, where Grand River Lake is, you see, Cherokee Lake is now. Right about uh, on the middle of the east side of that lake is where that school was at that time. I taught three years and run off and got married. <laughs> Talk about that school. Tell about that. Oh, the, the school was a lovely school, and I boarded with Mr. and Ms. Jim Hiltebrand. They had one little girl, about 13, and they wanted me to be sure to get her ready to come to school to seminary. So uh, I would give her special lessons. But I had all these 53 little full bloods, and there were some that could talk English and some that couldn't. So when uh, I found out that majority of them could really understand a little bit of English, but very few of them could. Why, well, I, I told him, I said, now listen, I can talk Cherokee. Don't you fool me. I can, I know what you're saying. In the schoolroom, we're going to talk English. On the playground, we're all going to talk Cherokee. Now, is that agreed? And they kind of grinned at me, and they hadn't heard me talk Cherokee. See, they, did, they thought I was a bluffing because the teacher they had the year before had bluffed them and they had to get rid of her. They didn't have no school. So I said, now, you just watch me. So uh, I went ahead and enrolled all of them and we just had a gay time, not recess, noon, before school and after school. I played with them out in the yard in the playground and I talked Cherokee to them and they'd talk Cherokee to me. But in the schoolroom, it was all English. Why don't you, uh, uh, you know, we, we, we have never gotten anything on recording in the Cherokee language. Why don't you uh, uh, talk to me a little in Cherokee? Mm -mm. Why don't you? you can't I won't anymore. You, you, no, you're not no, able to anymore? No, I gave it up after I quit teaching. Because I'm, <laughs> I don't know whether I have or not. Uh -huh. I married a man from up in Kansas. Uh -huh. He wasn't an Indian. He was uh, Irish and Welsh. Mm -hmm. Anyway, you don't remember enough to be able to... Uh, no, no, I would know what other language. people were saying oh, to me, but I wouldn't talk anymore. I no, I, I dropped all of that because I was up in Kansas where I had nobody, and my husband didn't want it. Yeah. When you were uh, in the school, uh, what were some of the activities outside of the classroom? Oh, we you? had basketball and croquet, and uh, one year we girls played football, and we all got hurt 
too much that we gave that up, but basketball and croquet and tennis was our big sports. Did you play tackle football? <laughs> yes, oh yes, we were tough as get out. <laughs> and got hurt at it and was all busted up, so we had to give it up. What position did you play? Oh, I was, I was, I was one of the honorary ones way at the end there. You were an end? Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. And uh, you, were a, you were a pass catcher then, too, I guess. What? Uh, you caught passes, too. Oh, you? yes. Yeah. Well, I was good at things like that. But I wasn't tall enough to play basketball. Mm -hmm. I was quick, and they let me play in the center mm -hmm. of basketball because I could jump and, and grab, but I, I was too short for did, the basket. Did you play against any other schools? Oh, yes, we played um, Baptist Mission. Did your football team ever play against? No, no, just the girls played against one another. Oh, we wouldn't play nobody else. We were scared to death. We, <laughs> and our uh, football field, we kept it hid back in the woods so none of the boys could come over and watch us. No, we wouldn't dare have them come and watch us. <laughs> and uh, our two teachers, Miss Beulah and Miss uh, Janana Ballard, were our teachers. Did, uh, uh, how did you dress to play football? Huh? How did you dress to play football? Just like the men did, just like the boys did. Did you wear pants? Oh, yes. That's the reason we never dared let the boys come and see us play. <laughs> We had regular, uh, they furnished us with the regular Shoulder outfits, pants. you know, short pants and sweater and uh, doings, even pants. pad on the shoulder. And, oh, well, we had it fixed, pad on our knees, but we skinned them up anyhow. <laughs> anyway, it was fun. We enjoyed it. And our basketball, though, we played that, uh, we played against uh, the uh, two missions, Baptist Mission and the Presbyterian Mission School here. And that's the only thing. And our tennis matches, we'd play anybody that would often play tennis with us. The school over at Muskogee, we'd come over and play tennis matches with us. How many students did you have about that time? 300 girls, and we all had smallpox the same year. Tell about that. Tell about the smallpox epidemic. The year of 1902. Tell, can you tell about that epidemic? Apparently, it was... Yes. We come back after Christmas vacation. We always had two weeks Christmas vacation. We all came back to school after Christmas vacation. And uh, in the dining room one morning, our nurse, Miss Rose Blackston was our nurse. She announced that there was two cases of smallpox up in the uh, nursery. See, third floor, north end, was the hospital nursery. They were three rooms for a hospital and then Aunt Rose Blackston, the nurse, had that. She told us smallpox. So that the doctor, doctor had been notified to come up and, and vaccinate everybody. Oh, what excitement that was. Nobody knew anything about vaccination. The full buds had never heard about vaccination. They'd never had smallpox or anything like that. They'd never had an epidemic. And they couldn't understand what it was like. They kept asking questions, what do you look like? And wanted to go up to the room and see the girls that had it. They'd caught it uh, down at Salisaw, two girls in Salisaw, two little full blood girls from down near Salisaw. So I'd come back and had it, broke out with it. Night Rose Blackson knew in a minute what it was. Well, everybody then, of course, had to go through the examination, uh, had to go through the uh, vaccination period. I was so busy doing something else that they'd missed me and I wasn't vaccinated. My sister, my roommate, she was vaccinated and her arm was bad and she had a high fever and all this and that broke out all around her hair and all with the smallpox. And the, uh, Miss um, Lindsay, Florence L Lindsay was my uh, teacher at that time. She says, why haven't you got it? You sleep with your sister. I said, I don't have to have everything she has. And she says, how was your vaccination? She come over and pushed my sleeve up. Wasn't no vaccination point there. She says, you go up and get that vaccination, young lady. And I said, the doctor's not here. She said, how do you know? I said, cause I was up there. And she says, all right, I'll take care of it. So she goes to the office then. And she tells um, 
I'm trying to think who our, who our It was a cousin of mine, and I can't think of his name, who was head of it there. But anyway, she told him that to get the doctor up there, one of the girls hadn't had no vaccination, and her sister had come down with the smallpox. So he lights out downtown after to hunt up the doctor. We only had one doctor in Telepa, only one. Well, he came back in about an hour. They split my sleeve and jugged that uh, a needle in my arm, and of course I had it bad. It just swelled way up. I was just sick, and I wasn't going to do nothing, but I did. <laughs> I had the smallpox, but they didn't know it. I had four or five bumps up in my head, but they never did know I had them. I combed my hair down. How don't you take over here? Excuse me, just one. Yes. No, you go ahead. Yeah. Well, I combed my hair down so nobody could see the bumps, and I got, I got along very nicely with the, did you know any of the teachers of that year? No, I was a Texas girl. I'm oh, you sorry. were, you were, weren't up I'm there. learning from you now. <laughs> well, anyway, I had the smallpox, but I didn't have it bad, and the fever didn't bother me, and so, uh, just three or four bumps come along the edge of my hair. I comb my hair. They were wearing big pompadours, putting her like they wear their big doings nowadays. Very Only much. the pompadour come over the forehead, over your for face a little bit, yeah. you know. And well, that covered it up, and so I, they never knew. I went right on to school. And my teacher, Miss Flora Lindsay, at the time, she said, I just don't understand you. You haven't missed a day of school. I said, well, oh, I'm too interested. <laughs> <laughs> and th so that's the way we got through the smallpox, but we didn't lose a girl. Mm -hmm. Every one of them came through very nicely. The 300 girls and the <coughs> teachers, some of the teachers had it, but their vaccination kept them from having it bad, and we went right on through school, never. And the girls that were real bad, of course, went up in the night, Rose Blackstone, our uh, nurse, took care of them with the doctor, and we all got through just fine that year. It, some of them didn't well, pass was, examinations and schoolwork, but they got through. <laughs> well, you know, vaccination then was considered so dangerous. It was <laughs> dangerous, too. Your arm would just swell up to Some of them put near lost their arm. They were mm -hmm. so sick about it, you know, a long time. Well, and then, too, uh, vaccine, you remember, gave out. Was it, yeah. They, lots, lots of uh -huh. people couldn't. Well, I know they had to bring in, I know our doctor had to bring in some from Muskogee over here to finish the 300 girls and the teachers over here mm -hmm. that year. But we got through very nicely. I look back on it as a, something kind of funny that we went through because after I was married and the World War I came up, we were living in San Diego, California. My husband was ship clock and chronometer man in World War I. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, he was stationed in San Diego. Mm -hmm. Well, he come home one night with the smallpox. He caught it from somebody. He'd been around somebody, and he came home. He says, I've, he told me, he says, I've got the smallpox. He says, I was vaccinated in world in the Spanish-American War. And he says, I may not have it bad, but he says, that's been so long ago, and the boys, di and they didn't have good vaccine them days. No. And he says, I may be pretty sick. You'd better lay in a supply of things so that you and the children, see, we had three babies then. Uh -huh. And uh, so I said, all right, then you stay in one part of the house and don't come where the children are and we'll keep the door closed, and then I'll take care of you and the babies because I've had the smallpox, and I don't need to worry about it. But, you know, you didn't have it any time you're exposed to it. Nowadays, why is that? Well, I think perhaps it's the vaccine that uh, is not right. It, uh, not, like the the not the type, not the kind, the maybe the strong is what I had at that time. Well, anyway, I nursed him through it, and he uh, got along all right. Well, then... Uh, after he was through with it, the uh, epidemic got out so bad in town, all, all, over the, all over the city, they began to have, uh, what do they call them, houses, at the pest houses, uh -huh, pest and houses. things like that. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, uh, my little boy, the oldest one, was in kindergarten. He was old enough to be in kindergarten. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, he came home one day with a note, 
and the, from his teacher saying that he should be vaccinated. What uh, should she do about it? And uh, I went over to see her. I asked her. It, uh, the school was only two blocks away, and I skipped out and went over and seen her, and I asked her. I said, are you having anybody to come to the school to vaccinate the children? She said, yes, and they'll be here tomorrow. The reason I sent you the note, so your little boy will be vaccinated. I said, can I send my little girl over too? She said, yes, if you want to. I said, all right, I'll send her over. She's uh, just a, uh, not two years younger than he is. She'll be coming to kindergarten next year. So the next day, I got her ready and told her she could visit school with her brother. Mm -hmm. So she got vaccinated along with it. But that didn't vaccinate the baby. Mm -hmm. So I was just scared to death for her. So when my husband got better and was able to be up and around, I told him, I said, now the children haven't been exposed to you and the older one too were vaccinated. But I said, I wish you'd send a doctor up here to vaccinate the baby. He said, well, supposing I tell him you can do it. And I said, I, I won't risk it. I said, I've had first aid training and uh, could take care of anything or anybody. But I said, I wouldn't want to vaccinate the baby. I said, with whatever they'd send out here. I said, I would rather take her over to school with the uh, let her be vaccinated with school children. And he said, well, find out if you can. So I called over the principal. He said, oh, yes, any family that's got babies and uh, want to bring them along with the children can bring them and have them vaccinated just the same. So they all three got vaccinated. They didn't have small, they didn't even have any fever. They just got along fine. So I've never been worried about them. Neither have they been worried about it since. They're probably lasting, too. I, I imagine it would last a long time. Well, anyway, that 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 was that now my children grown married and got children grandchildren two of them want to come and visit the old seminary yes. where i went to school where mother went to school where grandmother went to school and where their aunt went and their two uncles went so uh, they're coming in june to visit tahlequah wow. and the uh, old seminary and go over it and go out to the Indian affair out here in the country, you know, where they had that, and visit that, because they don't know anything about the Indians. They've lived in Colorado, Denver, yeah. born and raised the, her children, my oldest daughter's children, although my oldest daughter was born right up here at Bonita, where I was, yeah. but she was only just a year and a half old when her daddy got the job as a ship clock and chronometer, he had to go into the army, you see. Yeah. And so they gave him that job because he was a watch inspector for the Santa Fe Railroad. Mm -hmm. So they took him and placed him there, and that's how come us to live out there. Mm -hmm. But when that was over, we come back home to Kansas. So my children were all educated at the University of Kansas. They graduate there. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, this oldest daughter graduated, she wanted to be a teacher, just like I had been, her mother, grandmother had been, her great-grandmother had been, had all been teachers. So she wanted to be a teacher, so she took well, the how teacher. Much, uh, how much will there be uh, now that, uh, that is still standing, and how much of the tradition can you find to show them when they come? Well, I want them to visit the old seminary, and I, I take them through as much of it as, as I w had. Of course, there's so much new stuff now, uh, how much is it of the old? You I don't know. I haven't been over all of it. Uh -huh. I haven't been inside of it for, well, three years ago I was. Mm -hmm. Now, what's changed mm -hmm. about... They still call it the, the seminary. The but you seminary see, the old house. chapel is not... It's school rooms, isn't it? The old parlor. So. But that room, I hope, hasn't been changed on third floor, sleepy holler. Where we kids, all, where we all made our exhibit for the World's Fair in 1904, St. Louis, My. up <laughs> up in Sleepy Hollow. What was it? What exhibit? It is. Uh, we we uh, furnished the Indian Territory Building with their exhibit for the World's Fair in 1904. What did you put in it? Oh, everything in handcrafts, all the way from basket work to engraving and beadwork and uh, raffia work and point lace and embroidery and drawn work. We did all kinds of handcrafts that you can think of, because I knew it, and I, I taught, and I was one of the teachers for it, mm -hmm. and lost my diploma, because I didn't pass the English test. 
I was so busy with the exhibit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and the teachers made me attend normal well, to make up my English so I could get my diploma. Well. <laughs> and, and then they put me to teaching school. And because I could talk Cherokee, mm -hmm. they gave me the full-blood Cherokee schools up there in Turkey. <laughs> well, do you have any old pictures of that? I got all of them. Of that exhibit or anything like that? No, I don't have any of the exhibit, but I have of the girls that, that work with me on the exhibit and cool. the teachers. And uh, I have uh, a picture of 42 girls from the Delaware District of Cherokee Nation that were ever one cousins. <clears throat> teachers and all. 42 of us from Delaware District now. That's Delaware County now. Yes. Well, that was Delaware District of the territory. And there were four teachers from that district and 42 girls. And I have that picture of every one of us. And then I have the picture of the boys that graduated you in 1904. I remember the names of those. I know most every one of them. I believe if I put the picture in front of me, I could name every one of them. And every one of the boys. We ought to have that as a matter of uh, history and uh -huh. a copy of history. Uh -huh. And Why then the happen? girls that worked with me in making the exhibit, mm -hmm. I, uh, one of the teachers took a picture and I had it enlarged and I've got that. You don't have any of the old uh, publications or anything that came out, or were they? Uh, well, the, I don't the think the Board of Education ever took any pictures of it. They may have taken some no. after it was put in the territory of course, that building. Was before the day of annuals. And yeah, all of they never had codex either like they do yes, now. Right. And, and to take pictures like that. You had to have a person come yeah. out with the You had camera. to uh, do it yourself, you see. Yeah. Uh, and we didn't. Mm -hmm. We didn't have money enough to do it. We well, weren't wealthy well. enough. Folks weren't wealthy to let the children have well, Kodaks and things like that, like they do nowadays. Why, a youngster well, 10 and 12 years old has got their own Kodak the now. The first Kodak, that, or the first picture thing that I remember was one of these great big old tripod things that a man crawled yeah, in under yeah, the black. Yeah, yeah, that's the only kind they had them way. days. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And, and of course, now, country. why, uh, they can get history and all like that. Now, I have some annuals. Um, there's my brothers, the boys. Now, up here at this, um, oh. Seminary? Yeah, they're, they're um, where they put their, their, um, old things. Oh, museum. Yeah, in the museum. Well, that'll be. Uh, there, there are some things up there. Uh, now, my brother and his football team, he played football. Now, he and his team, are there are pictures up there. And, uh, of course, my sister's picture's in there, but mine's not. I don't have a picture up there. But what year was that? 19, 1901 and 2 and 3 and 4. See, 1904 was the World's Fair in St. Louis. That's right, so you led up to that. Uh-huh, and uh, that was my last year. So my mm -hmm. spring term was when I failed in English, <laughs> and they made me attend normal <laughs> in order to make it up so I could get my diploma. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, the campus life, what did you girls we played, do? And we uh, uh, our biggest game was tennis and basketball. Mm -hmm. Of course, we played croquet. Well, now, and we'd ride happen? anything that we could get on if we could ever get a horse. You rode it. Oh, we'd ride anything we could get on. And, of course, there were horse and buggy days. Yes. We could drive and so forth like that. But well, now, buggy, our game... buggy riding was one of the main dating things, yeah. wasn't it? Oh, yes. If you got a chance to date, or you had a boy that could afford to rent a horse and buggy. <laughs> oh, I see. Now, were, uh, were you chaperoned on these days? Oh my, yes. You never went down in town shopping without a uh, chaperone. Even here? Yeah. In Tahlequah? Oh yes, in Tahlequah. Well, that's the only place we ever got a chance to I go. I know, but uh, wasn't it a very small place then? Yes, ma'am. It was small. Not much bigger than it is right now downtown. But you had to have a chaperone. But you had to have a chaperone. Leave the campus. You didn't dare leave it outside of the wall. We had a fence around us way up this high, iron fence and the gate locked. My God. Only one you gate. Were you were valuable people. One <laughs> gate in that, and you didn't get through that gate without a chaperone. <laughs> now, I had five uncles and aunts living right here in this town. And they often invited my sister and I down to spend Saturday with them. The teacher took us down there 
and when time to come home brought us back. Now that was with my uncle Joseph Thompson, the Methodist minister of the Presbyterian Methodist Church right here in town. Now they were the closest kin, my grandmother's youngest brother, who was the Methodist minister for years and years and years. And then when he was too old to be Methodist minister, he was librarian of the new library they put in here. Well. And our exhibit that we uh, exhibited in St. Louis in 1904 was sold, and the money went into this library. Mm -hmm. That was well, now, how, uh, how it got started. In the, there, there were the two seminaries, the male and the, and the female, yeah. the men and the, and yeah. the women. Uh, uh, was there any type of uh, dating or amusements in between the two seminaries? The, boy, the boys could send a girl a ticket to attend a football game when they were having a big football game, but they had to be chaperoned. But the boyfriend could send her a ticket. He had to send it to the teacher. Miss Ryder uh, was our principal when I was here, the four years I was here. And the ticket was sent to her in an envelope saying who it was for. All right. Then she had to supply a Chaperone. That was your date then? That was a date. Well. And <laughs> I, re I remember once we were allowed to have dates in the parlor. Oh, oh uh, I remember parlor dates. Yeah, the that's, parlor dates. Well, okay. you see, if we put on a play and the town folks and the boys from the seminar oh. were invited to a play we put on, mm -hmm. why, we could have a date for one hour in the parlor after the play. With a chaperone present. Oh my, yes. I remember that. <laughs> Who is this? This is uh, Mr. Pace. And he's listening to us. <laughs> well, anyway, that's the way we had dates. They were, during the four years that I was here, we had two girls to run away and marry. Wonder how they ever got the arrangement they, made with such close. Support. Well, <laughs> they, it was figured they must have arranged it when they were at home in probably, vacation, probably during vacation time, and because it was a boy. And letters, I suppose there were letters. Well, no, the letters were censured. We couldn't write letters, no letters to a boyfriend. By whom? Huh? Who who censured? Why they weren't ever mailed. They weren't allowed to be mailed out. <laughs> Your letter was, you wrote your letter home to your family. Oh. See? And uh, uh, they knew your family. Mm -hmm. But if you write a letter and the letter went to a boy over at the seminary, you, that letter never got there. Well, one way. That's, uh, that's, that's uh, what you call censorship. Sure yes. Enough, isn't it? Yes, it indeed it was. Mail. Well, anyway, I was here four years, never had a boyfriend, never had a date. Four mm -hmm. years. You couldn't very well under the circumstances, I imagine. <laughs> I didn't care. Well, I, most of the boys were kin folks anyway. They're putting her, every one was my cousins. Yeah. We were all kin. Uh -huh. The Indian children were brought up by, they were uh, 88 families that came through the Trail of Tears to the territory. Mm -hmm. And every one of them were sisters and brothers' families, mm -hmm. and grandparents' families. That's right. And there were 88 of those I families. How that would be. And you see, most of us kids were, were sister and brother's children. Mm -hmm. And, and, you, and you didn't care to have a boyfriend uh, um, uh, being extra fine to you when he was your cousin and be nice to you anyhow. That's right. I have a cousin by the name of uh, Fry, and uh, he has, uh, he claims he has some Cherokee blood, and I've just been dying to find out if I can't find some somewhere. It's, it's my cousin. You yeah, know, why right. do I have some? <laughs> well, anyway, that's the way we were censured. And uh, these two girls that uh, climbed over the fence and got away and uh, went over to Muskogee and got married and then went to her folks in Claremore and told them they were married. That was one of the girls. Her name was Beulah Light. Beulah Light. Mm -hmm. and From Claremore. And she married whom? She married a boy the name of, I don't know what his first name was, I don't remember, but his name was Smith. And he was on the Dawes Commission down here. You heard him talking about yes. that Dawes Commission oh, yes. doings? Yes. All right. He was there. Well. Worked there. So they come back to Tulloch to live after they went home to her parents, see? Mm -hmm. And then come back here. 
but she didn't get to graduate. <laughs> And she was senior, too, in good standing in her classes. Well, married women weren't allowed to. Oh, no. No, I should say not. Why, they were not even liked when they come back on the visit. <laughs> uh, oh. I wonder how uh, your viewpoint of the uh, campus activities that we have today, would you mind commenting just a little bit? Oh, on that? there's such a difference. There's I too much there's difference. difference. You see, my children went to the University of Kansas to school, yeah. and uh, the uh, grade schools, I went right along with them. I was PTA prayer, uh, president and all this yeah. and that, and grade school and high school and, and city council and program in the state mm -hmm. of Kansas. So I kept up with my children. Mm -hmm. I didn't let them do like a lot of folks did. Mother was always there, and they knew mother was somewhere in the audience, regardless how big that audience was at a football game or at a basketball game or a tennis match. Mother was somewhere in that audience. <laughs> well, that's and uh, I often think that in a city like Kansas City, well, you just don't dare turn children loose. No. Or at least I didn't. No. I had been chaperoned so terribly close yeah. As a child growing up, I didn't want that. Mm -hmm. But I liked those things. I liked football. I liked basketball. I liked sports of all kinds. So I just made that excuse for being with the children. That I love that. Why can't I go? Yeah. And my son thought it was perfectly all right. But I noticed once in a while the girls didn't approve. <laughs> but nevertheless, mother was there. Mm -hmm. They knew it. <laughs> well, what about the grandchildren now? Are they in? Uh... Well, I haven't had a chance to be with my grandchildren. Mm -hmm. Now, my oldest daughter has three daughters, and they're all married. And my other daughter has a son and a daughter. Mm -hmm. All right, her son is a doctor. He's a research doctor in the uh, big research hospital in Houston, Texas. Cancer and tumor research. Mm -hmm. That's where he is. His name is? His name is Mine, M E Y N, Dr. Raymond E. Mine. Mine. And his mm -hmm. wife is a school teacher in the grade school in Houston, Texas. They both live mm -hmm. there and they both work. All right, that's her son. Her daughter is a nurse, graduated at the uh, Nurses College in Kansas City and became a nurse. Mm -hmm. And uh, she married a young fellow who was a meteorologist in the uh, Cape Kennedy, uh, where the men go up in the uh -huh, skies. Uh huh. All right, he's their meteorologist, and she is a nurse. Well, they have a little daughter, just mm -hmm. born last February. So that's that side. The oldest daughter has three girls, all three married. The oldest one uh, finished at the high school in Denver and won a scholarship, went to the University of Colorado and graduated, married. And she married a, a young fellow that was in with the government in uh, electronics. Mm -hmm. They make things for the fellow that goes up to the moon, right. all that stuff. Mm -hmm. All right, that's what they do. All right, her second daughter uh, wanted to go to the same college her mother did. So after she graduated in high school in Denver, she begged to go to the University of Kansas to finish in the same college that her dad and mother had finished in. Mm -hmm. She wanted like that. All right, they let her go. They could afford it. Mm -hmm. So she was sent over to Kansas, fell in love with a young professor at the university, and married there after she graduated, though. Mm -hmm. She went ahead and finished, though, and then married this young professor. And he's at the University of Kansas, and that's where they live. Mm -hmm. What they, is that name, please? Her name is Schlager, Dr. Schlager. Mm -hmm. Dr. Uh, Gunther Schlager mm -hmm. is the professor at the University of Kansas. And that's where they live. The other ones, are the oldest one, one that's in um, uh, electronics, their name is, uh, I'll say it in a minute, Gossett, uh -huh. Doc, uh, Newton Gossett. The, he has his doctor's degree from the University of Missouri. Mm -hmm. Well, her youngest daughter then married a, a young doctor of law. And they're in Southern California, in the University of Southern California, located right out of San Diego. Is he teaching there? Yes. He's a professor of law uh -huh. at that school. And so his that's... Name, his name is... His name is Yost, Dr. William Yost. A. Yost. Uh -huh. that, you have quite a distinguished <laughs> family. 
the grandchildren. <laughs> well, my son is has been a, a court reporter in Washington, D.C., 38 years. Yes. When he finished college and got in with, with uh, uh, Senator Reed of Missouri, and went to New York. Went to Washington D.C. with him as his court reporter. But then, when Reed was through, why he just stayed on with the court reporters in Washington, and, and he's, he's been there ever since. His given name is uh, William Ernest Bishop. William Ernest. Bishop. That's my first husband's oh, name. Yes. Uh -huh. My first husband was Bishop. 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 From, he was born uh, and raised in Independence, Kansas. Uh, what do you think of the? Uh, uh, the campus activities that the young people indulge in today, such as I don't like it a bit. Such as their way they express no. themselves. No, I don't like sense. it one bit. I don't like the way they dress. I don't like the way they look. I don't like any of their activities. And I can't tolerate it. I just can't. I don't know why. Now, I raised all my family. Now, I raised them up in the city, and they went to college, and they did everything. They belonged to all the activities, such as football and racing and, and uh, track and basketball. Around. They were all in all those things, as mm -hmm. well as dramatics and music and things mm -hmm. like that. The girls all was in things like that. Mm -hmm. And they didn't carry on like this, like they're doing nowadays. I've got eight great-grandchildren, and I just bet you not a one of them boys are like they are now. Now, the oldest one is 17, great-grandson. Next but one is 15. They claim that it's the only way they can be heard, to be understood. They don't have to be heard. They go to college to learn. <laughs> they're, they're sent to college to learn something. They don't have to get up and ball the teachers out or have a fight over something but or do like, no, I just can't. They think that, uh, and they, they say that, uh, that uh, the generation gap, gap is so great that we can't understand. Oh, that. it's not, though. That gap is not so great. You can understand, yes, so can I. I. Yes, I and I'm great-grandmother, and I still can understand the side of the young people. But I still work with some of the young people I know. groups in Oklahoma City. I talk to them. I That's heard. where I get their story, you see, their side yeah. of it. Yeah, you I, get the... I, would, I have often wondered how it could be presented, if we could some way present uh, the traditional side of things to them in such a way that, that they could understand. Not us, but if they could understand. Well... I never had no problems like that. Mm -hmm. I just never had any, and I just don't like the ones I have now. Now, last year, a year ago last October it was, the two years is coming, my uh, granddaughter there in Boulder, that uh, her husband is in electronics, they wanted to go to see the uh, 13th, you know, go up to the moon. Uh -huh. Yeah. Because he Apollo made... Apollo 13. Yeah. And they wanted to go to Florida. Well, they couldn't take the children out of school to go to Florida. Four of them. Three boys and a girl. And uh, she didn't have nobody to leave them with. I volunteered to take care of those four children while uh, they went to Florida to see that, uh, the astronaut go up, the 13th mm -hmm. go up in that. Right. And... Uh, uh, then they wanted to go then from there to uh, to um, Hawaii to see him land. Mm -hmm. See, they wanted to see the whole thing yes. because he'd been working on that. That was mm -hmm. the uh, one that he'd worked on. Mm -hmm. So he wanted to see how it worked. Well, you see, you remember, it didn't work. There was mm -hmm. part of it blew it out. Mm -hmm. uh, that blew out, and a uh, young fellow from Denver that was an astronaut had fixed it. Well, that young fella that had got in, the, in there had gone to school with Sue in high school. Mm -hmm. and, and naturally, that made them feel like they had to go and see all of that go through with. So I volunteered to go out to Boulder and take care of those four children while they made that trip. I did. That must I, have been interesting. It was. There was uh, two of them in junior high and two in high school. So uh, one boy was 16, one was 15, one was 14, and the girl was 13. Just a little over a year between those four children. Mm -hmm. They knew more about everything than I did. <laughs> now, and it's the truth. 
They, okay. why, well, they did. They just knew everything. They uh, had, they knew how to run that house better than their mother or I either one. That little girl could cook anything you mentioned. Thirteen. There's no doubt about that. And the boys could do the same thing. They could cook. They a clean house. They could run the washing machine. They could iron their own clothes. They could do everything like that. And um, I asked David one day, the oldest one, the one that was uh, 17, would be 17 in January. I said, David, why haven't you got sideburns like these other boys in high school? He says, you know, grandmother, I see, I was their great grandmother, but they called me grandmother. He says, you know, I don't think it'd be very becoming on me. He says, I had got right black hair and that'd be all black down there. I said, well, did you try it? He said, I thought once of doing it, but then I changed my mind. I just decided I would just be clean like my dad. See, his dad never grew there and he was gonna be like his dad. Well, the next boy, the one that was 16, Danny, I said, Dan, you've got red, kind of red hair. Would you look nice with red whiskers? He said, I'm not going to have any red whiskers. I said, well, now, why? Some of the boys in, in the high school have got whiskers and red whiskers. He says, now, Grandmother, would you kiss me if I had a whisker? I said, no, I wouldn't. <laughs> he says, my mother wouldn't either. <laughs> and we jollied about that. Well, then uh, the little girl, 13-year-old girl, and I was putting on some earrings one day. And uh, she says, Grandmother, do you think that I ought to have my ears pierced so I can have some long earrings? I said, well, good gracious, Catherine, you could have long earrings hang way down here and not have your ears pierced. I said, they fasten on. I said, I'll tell you something. When my sister and I were little, six and seven years old, Mother had her ears pierced because okay. everybody was wearing earrings, but they had to be go through the holes. And I said, you know what happened to my sister? I said, one day she was playing. Her hair was hanging down. And I said, her hair got caught in her earring mm -hmm. that she was wearing. And she was playing black man with a bunch of boys, and they grabbed her hair and pulled the earring clear out of her ear and tore her ear clear out. Mm. I said, that's what happens to little girls when they have the ears pierced. I said, now, when you get a grown woman and, and want to do it, that's all right, but don't have it done while you're little. I said, that's what happened to my sister. And I said, mm -hmm. I'll, I never would wear earrings after that. Mm -hmm. I said, until they begin pinching on uh -huh. and, uh, and yeah. like that. And I said, uh, from that on, I, well, then she changed her mind. She didn't have hers pierced. Mm -hmm. So she got well, the your family seems to uh, <laughs> seems to have remained pretty well then with the establishment, doesn't it? <laughs> well, I feel a, a nice and like that. Know. Now the other rest of the children are smaller. Mm -hmm. The uh, granddaughter in Lawrence, her children are younger, and I haven't mm -hmm. been with them any. See, and I had never been with those out there until I went out to take care of them. Mm -hmm. Now, if the one in Lawrence will let me look after hers while she takes a vacation yeah. sometime, well, I'll get acquainted with them. Of course, they're only eight, nine, and ten years old. Mm -hmm. Your teenagers, I think. Turn that off. We don't want to talk anymore. This isn't seminary stuff now. Oh, well, uh, <laughs> you come after me. My brother's downstairs. Just a minute. Waiting me for me. Just a minute. All right. <laughs> oh, my brother and I went to school seminary in 19 and 1, 2, 3, and 4. What, when did you go? Oh, you were here then when Brother Henry was here. The next interview will be on the opposite side of this tape.